Okay, good afternoon everyone. Uh, so my name is Julien Veillon. Uh, I work for a company called Aweber. We do a lot of uh, internet stuff with email marketing and things. Um, and uh, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, managing firewalls in kind of a cloud type environment. So uh, my interest, I'm a security engineer um, and my interest is in performance, but not the same type of performance that those guys have been talking about the rest of the day. Uh, what I'm interested in is how much time it takes to actually deploy a new node and to manage a new set of firewall rules, or how much time it takes to um, figure out which rule is blocking uh, a connection or things like that. So I'm really more oriented on the uh, firewall management aspect of things, and a little less in the low level performance of the uh, firewall stack itself. Um, so one problem that we we have, um, and whether in many other environments, is that uh, with a classic firewall setup, you have a few very big border and core firewalls that process a lot, lot, lot of packets. And to do that correctly, you need a lot of rules. Um, what happens very quickly if you manage those firewalls for a long period of time is that you have rules in there, thousands of rules that uh, either becomes really inefficient or in the this, somewhere in this rule, we have a rule that opens a lot more than it should, uh, literally bypassing everything else and bypassing the policy. Uh, I've seen firewall collapse, proprietary firewalls that cost a lot of money collapse at like four or five thousand rules, uh, literally drop, and at that point, you don't have any connection going through anything. Uh, so we've had those problems. Um, the solution, and um, that's what I'm going to talk about today, is uh, using host-based firewalls, so having the firewall run on the node itself. Um, and that obviously makes managing the firewalls a lot more complicated because uh, instead of having two or three rule sets, then you have probably a few hundreds or a few thousand rule sets or hundred thousands rule sets to manage. Um, so we're going to talk about that. Um, who am I? Uh, so I'm a systems and security engineer at Aweber. Um, Aweber is a web company that started in, in the late 90s. There's a lot of different types of server in that company, and it's kind of very heterogeneous to manage, but everything is, for the most part, Linux-based. Um, so I, my interest is in building and securing web infrastructures. Uh, so everything from the network, firewall, and application size well, web servers, mail servers, and that. Um, Did you take that picture in California? Uh, I took that pic in north of Spain, right next to oh. Santander. Uh, and uh, yes, it's very good, but the wine is French. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, so I have some code if you want to check it out at some point. Uh, yeah, we're discussing photos of cats in presentations, that's pretty much the only one I have. Uh, so, uh, very quickly, uh, go through the history of, of uh, firewalls. In the 70s, everything was simple. You had two machines, you had to send a packet between them. Uh, yeah, it worked. Uh, or not, but if it worked, you make that face. So they, didn't really, they weren't really concerned about security at that point. We were more concerned about reliability, and that's really how uh, TCP is designed. It's like you need to send a packet from point A to point B, and if it doesn't go through, we send it. And they have the mechanisms in place for that, but they don't have the mechanism to actually ensure that uh, your stack is protected. Um, so we started building, in the 90s, we started building uh, DMZs. And uh, we put all the public servers in those DMZs. That was great. So you have a few firewalls that are just uh, uh, at the border of your DMZ, protecting your uh, public servers. And then you have your production land that you don't want to have exposed to the internet that's protected by another firewall. And you have your office network with another firewall, et cetera. And that works great. Um, it starts to become a little bit complicated for managing the rules and opening and closing, especially at that point, there was pretty much no way to manage that centrally. So a lot of those firewalls had wide open rules, so they would just open put 80 for the entire network because it's a public thing, um, that kind of stuff. Then in 2000, we had a lot more servers, and suddenly your DMZ kind of looks like that. Um, at that point, you still have the same type of firewalls and uh, not a very efficient way of managing the servers individually. Uh, so what happened is, well, we decided that we needed web application firewalls. So we put them in the middle of everything, and now we had uh, firewalls and web application firewalls and uh, IDS and IPS and all sorts of centralized logging and everything. And at somewhere at that time, your developers stopped trying to connect to a destination server. They just, they just stopped. They tried to do it differently because they couldn't open routes. Um, 
I work for companies where it will literally take three weeks to a month to open a connection from a server to another using a workflow with a web interface and you had it reviews by three different people, etc. cetera. Uh, and that worked great, except when the workflow was done, the rule didn't actually work, so you need to test it, go back to the workflow. It was a huge nightmare. And that workflow still didn't have a way to delete rules. So if an application died after five years, the rules were still in place in the firewall. And that's how we got to a point where 4,000 rules in a firewall would just make it collapse. Um, so that's around 2010. Yeah, and it's still the case today. Um, that's pretty much those numbers at the bottom are random, not coming from actually from actual measurements. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much what I saw in a bunch of organization. And, and what I, we saw at Aweber too is we had those massive appliances that cost a lot of money and are really difficult to manage and might even add latency uh, to your network. Uh, especially if you have a web application firewall and you have a policy that is not exactly well written, you will add a lot of latency to your connections. Uh, if you have an IDS, you probably will end up with thousands and thousands of alerts per day if, if everything works fine. If something goes wrong, we're talking hundreds of thousands. Um, so that doesn't necessarily, I, I, I can't manage that. I spend my day trying to read logs and it doesn't work. So we try to do something, things a little bit differently and that's where we start talking about service-oriented architecture. And actually, uh, developers and not security people started working on that. It's the code became so massive that they wanted to decouple things better and build uh, layers of services. Um, and in a typical environment, you will then have a caching layer uh, that sits at the top of your web infrastructure. Then you will have a front-end services that probably going to be your uh, Apache with uh, uh, front-end code, PHP, Node.js, whatever you want to run. And in the back end, multiple services that, in that case, are REST APIs. So uh, your architecture, instead of being that one monolithic uh, application that serves everything, is broken down into smaller services. And those services are great because they are a lot easier to manage. You can identify where they are in the network, what systems, uh, what servers are actually running the services, and you can treat them as pretty much independent entities from a security point of view. So it's a lot easier to manage use than the big, big monolithic application than before. But there are more nodes, so you have to jump more hops to uh, go through the whole stack. Cloud stack requirement, no single point of failure, uh, optimized resource organization. So we use usually, um, however, we use uh, a lot of VMs on KVM, and we try to make them as small as possible so that they use, uh, we try to evaluate how much CPU and how much VM they need. Um, some applications don't need a lot of resources, they just do a few requests per second, so they really don't have the need for hundreds of thousands of uh, uh, I don't know, gigabyte of memory and, uh, and CPUs and things like that. Um, and in the soft service oriented architecture, there's a subgroup that's service oriented security. And if you've played with um, Amazon EC2, that's something that uh, they kind of did uh, out of the box in their uh, Amazon Web Services tools. Um, when you create a virtual machine, uh, an instance, as they call it, in EC2, uh, you need to create a security group for it. And what a security group is, it's really just a group of firewall groups. And you will say, uh, my instance lives in security group uh, X, for example. And inside your security group management, you will open a, a rule that allows it to connect to security group Y on that port. And that's how you can manage groups of instances as opposed to managing servers directly. And that is great because you can have 10,000 servers in your, serv in your security group. It doesn't matter. They all apply the same policy. Um, the problem is, as far as I know, a server cannot be multiple security groups. So you kind of have to design them in a way that's not optimal. Uh, but it's still a lot better than having to manage those rules manually because you don't have to create a new node. You don't have to go in, create your firewall manually, add your rules, and then monitor it. It's just done automatically. Um, so this is kind of how you would design your policy for the service above. It's, uh, the one at the top is accept everything to the caching layer on port TCP 80. The second is accept everything from caching to front end on port TCP 80 and nothing else. Uh, Etc. So front end to service X, front end to service Z, uh, and those rules work both ways. They are inbound on the side of the receiving service and outbound on the sending service. Um, and then within a service, 
you will have the rules at the bottom, except API to database on port TCP 5432, for example. So if you look at service X, you see that the REST API needs to connect to the database, and that's a connection that's represented by the intro service policy. So you have two types of policies, the one that, that's for the service itself and the one for in the inter-service. Um, and this is kind of how we define scalability in the term of how many VMs you're running. Um, suddenly, your service X needs two new VM. So what happens here at the firewall level, and this is how we manage it with AFW, is that you have two new VMs that are here so they don't have access to anything. So you need first to give them access to the database, which means you need to go on the database and you need to say, hey, I have two new VMs. These two new VMs need to have access to the database endpoint. And on the REST API servers themselves, you need to tell them, hey, your outbound firewall needs to open access to that database specifically. Not the other one, just this one. And on the front-end service, same thing. Uh, the front-end service needs to discover that um, there's a REST, two new hosts that exist in the service X, and those two new hosts would serve REST API traffic, so they need to open their outbound firewall. At the REST API level, they need to discover the upper layer, the web front-end layer, to open their inbound firewall for it. Uh, so to do all of that, uh, we use a tool that's called Chef. And um, you probably know about CF Engine, Puppet. There's another one written in Python that's called Salt. Uh, there's a few of them. What those tools do is, instead of writing a bash script to provision a service, then you will write a whatever script. In that case, a, a Chef script is called a cookbook. Um, and a, a Puppet script is called a module. Uh, and that is going to do the job of going on the server or running on the server itself, installing a package, say Apache, and then templating the configuration file. So there's site available, default, or site available, whatever. Um, those tools will do that for you. Um, so that goes in the cookbook. And then you will wrap this cookbook, say if you have uh, five different cookbooks, Apache, MySQL, Postgres, something, you will, and you want a group of servers to all apply those cookbooks, you will put that into a role. So the role of that server will be uh, you're the accounting application. And the role contains a number of the, the name of the cookbooks to run and potentially uh, configuration variables. And those configuration variables is where we're going to put the firewall rules. So a new server comes in, a new virtual machine comes in, we assign it a role. What happens then is that um, the chef client is installed on that new uh, server, what is called the node. Um, and the chef client will connect to the chef server and ask, hey, I'm supposed to be an accounting application server, what do I do next? The chef server, that central database that knows everything about everything, will tell the node, you have to run all of those cookbooks and here are your configuration variables. And the, the node itself downloads that and executes it locally, installs all the packages, templates the configuration file, and when it's done, tells the chef server, well, I'm done and I'm ready to go. Uh, of course, that means that the files that are managed by chef cannot be edited manually. Uh, well, technically it can, but next time Chef runs, it will reset those files to whatever Chef wants them to be. Um, the major advantage, if you use Puppet, uh, and we're just having this discussion, if you use Puppet, uh, you probably know all of that already. The difference with Chef is that Chef has that central database that uh, for each node will keep a big JSON document that contains everything about the node. And by everything, I mean the number of CPUs, the CPU flags, the memory, uh, the name of the uh, packages that are installed, uh, the list of users, whatnot. It could be anything. It's literally huge. And that entire document is pushed inside the Chef database. So you can re literally query anything for any node from the Chef server. And that data is used to synchronize groups of servers. So, for example, I'm going to show that in the MongoDB rules later, but if you have a MongoDB replica set and you have two MongoDB servers in the cluster, you add a third one, the third one doesn't know anything about the neighbors. It's going to find its neighbors by searching the chef server and saying, hey, give me the nodes that share the same shard name, for example. And the chef server will say, sure, I have two other guys, uh, A and B, add them to your configuration. And that new MongoDB server will connect to A and B and say, hey, I'm new to the group, can I have some data, please? And that's automated, you don't need to do it manually. And that, that is kind of, that's really what's at the core of AFW. AFW is a cookbook for Chef that does exactly this. It will search for a node that it needs to open the firewall for, or two. That's an example of search. Uh, the knife is a client that you will run on your, 
on your computer as a system administrator, and you can retrieve that kind of data from the chef server. So here we're searching for uh, all of the nodes that have the role web front end and that are in the environment named staging. And that will return three nodes. So we see one of them here that in the beginning of the second one uh, with um, some attributes for the nodes, uh, the list of roles, what they're running, the list of recipes, that kind of stuff. The platform it's running on, that kind of thing. Um, and here's how we do, uh, in, in actual code, how we do a search. So if you're writing, uh, everything in Chef is, is written in Ruby. Um, so if you want to search for the list of OSX agents, for example, you write a, 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 a recipe that provisions an OSX server, and you want that OSX server to know about all of the agents. So you're going to do a search in that syntax. Search for the nodes that matches this query, roles OSX agent and Chef environment product. I didn't have enough room to write production, but that's. And then you do something with that result. OSEC agent, each two agents that just a loop that goes over the list of agents and does something with it. Um, so that's what Chef does. Uh, and that's exactly what I was talking about. Because Chef can search the entire infrastructure, um, it can be used to generate a firewall policy automatically. Um, and all we need is a way to manage that. So, um, before we go into FW itself, one thing that there's a lot of, there are a lot of wrappers around IP tables, and uh, they aim at making IP tables more simple than it is because people don't want to learn IP tables. Um, I don't, I don't care about that. If people don't know IP tables, they can open the book and learn it. That's not the point. Um, the point is not to make the writing of firewall rules more simple. It's to make it easier to manage, um, and I had to kind of wrap the IP table syntax over something that can be fed into, uh, into Chef, but I also left the support for like raw firewall rules that you can just pass it on and not worry about it. So what AFW is, is a way to declare rules that will be processed by Chef, uh, not to simplify the writing of firewall rules. Uh, so that's what I'm going through very, very quickly. Uh, automated rule set creation, one-to-one uh, -one rules only. So if you have five nodes on one side that need to talk to five nodes on the other side, then each node will have five rules to the back end. So it's one-to-one -one rules. Um, and yes, it's less efficient than just creating uh, uh, or opening the rules to a subnet or something like that. Um, one thing that I'm considering uh, and uh, I think it's going to be one of the major features is to, instead of creating individual rules, is to create one rules and put all the destination in the set. And there's match against that set. Um, but that makes like, listing the rules and managing the rules a little, a little more difficult. Uh, User-specific outbound rules. Um, so IP table has that amazing module that can just look up the owner of a socket. And you can say, you can go out if your UID is, I don't know, uh, the itchy proxy, for example, uh, something like that. So instead of opening an outbound rule that is open for all of the users of a system, you can open it for just one user. And that's very useful when you can, when you anticipate that this application would have to go out, but nobody else needs to. Uh, generic rules, and we're gonna try to write rules that are uh, for a group of services, so if you have 10 services that are identical that all need to connect to their own database, then I don't want to have to write 10 different rules. I want to have to write one rule that says search for your database and open your connection, period. Um, it uses, under the hood, uh, what AFW does is really create an, uh, a, a rule set that's in IP table save format, uh, and that it creates that and just load it using IP table save and load it in the, in the kernel. Uh, it reloads a rule every time. Uh, loading a rule in the kernel is fairly cheap, so we do it uh, pretty much all the time. Uh, and some features, yeah, well, I talked about that. It's fast to reload, blah, 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 contract, etc. Okay, so what it, this is what it looks like. Um, RabbitMQ, MQB producer. So that's a very simple rule that doesn't actually use anything really dynamic. It's what you would write in a normal static rule. It connects, uh, it accepts connection from a list of sources. So those are FQDN's uh, host names and they are not dynamics, they are not searched for. They're just uh, statically defined. Uh, one little advantage of that over doing it in IP tables is 
when you use a host name in IP table, it will use a DNS resolution when it loads the rules, and it will grab one IP only. If you have four IPs in a DNS loop, then you would not get all four of them. Uh, that cookbook will do it for you. So if you're trying to open an outbound connection to, uh, I don't know, some, like, I know one, like the API at Twilio.com, and you have three IPs coming back, then you want to open the outbound firewall for all three IPs, and not just the one that came back when you loaded the rules. Um, so that format uh, is in chef format, and we just opened the inbound and outbound, uh, actually both inbound, for Zeus servers. Uh, now we can do it uh, in a more flexible way. Uh, the one on the right is what I wrote for OSSEC agent and servers. Um, so they need to connect on port 1514 in UDP, and uh, I don't want to have to manage the IPs dynamically. Uh, the OSX server will probably be static, but the agents come and go. Every time I create a new VM, it's a new OSX agent. I don't want to have to add it to the list. So what I do is, um, on the OSX uh, server, it will run that rule that's at the top, except all inbound connection coming from, and the source is roles OSX agent. That is fed into Chef. Chef will execute a search that will return a list of nodes that match that search. Take all of the APs for those nodes and put them in the rule set. Next time Chef runs, 30 minutes after, it will update the rule set. If a node appeared or if a node disappeared, it will remove it. Um, same thing uh, on the one at the bottom here, uh, MongoDB uh, app entry point, and that's what I was saying. We have a bunch of MongoDB servers, and each of them live in their own service, and here they will um, we'll open the firewall for the role Node.js uh, or Python worker or API server, which are likely to be application servers. So that's a search query format, and then we return a list of IPs. Um, and once I've said that, I pretty much said everything about the main part of AFW. Now, the rest is, uh, how much time do I have left? I need to name the filer now. Sure. 22 minutes. 22 minutes. All right. Uh, I can sing. No. I, there's a few more features, because once, once that was done, and it was really the main goal of, of doing that, it was a lot easier already to declare firewall rules and manage firewall rules. Um, we can make it a little more granular. Uh, the notion of service is at Weber we tried to regroup everything under uh, a service. But a service is, is defined as where you're running that version of the code and you have that database. But at the infrastructure level, there was really almost no way to define a service. Um, Chef has that uh, tag attribute that you can give a tag to a VM or to a node, whether it's a physical server or a VM, it doesn't matter. You can give a tag to a node, so you give a tag to a set of nodes and you tell them, well, your tag is service X. And on this side, you tag the service Y. And then you have a way in Chef to differentiate different services. Um, and you can use that when you write the firewall rules. Um, but not completely dynamically. So I created that, that same tag uh, keyword that would be understood by the cookbook as, hey, I'm running on the, the REST API X at the top here and I want to list all of the other nodes that have the same tag. So which ones are my tags first? Okay, pull the list of tags that I own, then look for all of the other nodes that have the same tags as me and have the role app server. And what that translates to is the query we see at the bottom with that's for the MongoDB database, not the application server, but it's the same thing. It will transform into role MongoDB and tag X and chef environment something. And that returns a list of nodes that are added automatically. Now that's for service X, it didn't pull any node from service Y. That's how we differentiate. Uh, I mentioned that uh, a little bit already. Um, firewall and MongoDB cluster. So that instead of having to create, um, and we really like MongoDB clusters, however, like we have a lot of them. Um, and it's kind of difficult when you add a new node and you remove a node or something from a cluster to remember to have to create and remove the firewall rules. So what we did is, um, in the firewall rule here, the this, this search actually pulls something from the node attribute. So that syntax is a chef syntax that says the node MongoDB short name uh, will go into the JSON document of the node, look for uh, the MongoDB key, and inside that, the short name key retrieves a value and feed it back into the search. So if the short name is like cluster one, two, three, <coughs> the search that is actually executed is 
should have named colon uh, cluster one, two, three. And because by default we don't want to cross environments and we want to stay in the, you know, in the same environments, it will, it will append to it uh, SHA uh, cluster one, two, three and chef environment production or chef environment staging. So your nodes in staging and production can be identical. By default, they don't have firewall rules that will allow them to talk to each other. Um, so that works for the inbound and outbound replication. Um, there's a, uh, I've been asked by my fellow sysadmins and developers to kind of refactor that and make one single block to do in and out. Um, I decided not to, and that's really a choice. It's because uh, I don't want um, people to make one big block that does everything at the same time. I want to keep the rules as atomic as possible. Um, by using this technique, we really reduce. I think right now we're managing the entire infrastructure with something like 120, 130 rules uh, for everything. And those are generic rules that, once they get expanded, become thousands and thousands of different rules. But we have a very minimal uh, syntax that kind of manages everything. So we, there's really no need to make it more, uh, to factor it more and put more features into each block. Um, and like I said, well, uh, the problem with wrappers is you reduce the features of the service. So if you want to do a firewall rule that's a little more funky and uh, you don't want to be bothered with, with using the wrapper or talking to FW, you can just put your rule um, inside a predefined block. And what that will do is just, instead of applying all of the uh, backend logic of FW, it would just copy the string inside the rule set directly. One of the big problem, and uh, that's kind of why at that point I'm kind of wondering if, uh, if that system shouldn't be built outside of Chef. The problem is that Chef is not great at security. Um, and that's something that I, I talked to the Chef guys about. And I, I don't know, they seem to have some solutions in the professional version, but the community version is not great. So um, each node uh, has its own JSON document, right, that is pushed to the Chef server. And uh, if you have uh, 200 systems and nodes living one next to each other, each of them can modify its own JSON document, push it back to the Chef server. Now, that JSON document contains everything. It contains the run list, it contains the tags, it contains everything. That means a node that, for example, has a Chef environment production tag uh, cluster one, two, three, and run list uh, MongoDB. If that node gets hacked and somebody has root access to it, well, that somebody can go into the chef uh, terminal, change the value of the tag, like here, so it pulls the node tags that returns foo, node tags push bar, it has the foo bar, and then do node save, and that is pushed to the chef server. So a node can change its identity from being node one to suddenly being a, a member of the accounting cluster. And that sucks. Um, so what that means, if, if you're using chef, and you want to build uh, an infrastructure that is really secure, you either need to build your security methods outside of Chef, or at least have safeguards outside of Chef, or, uh, well, or you're screwed. So you really need a way to make sure that if somebody gets, or, or hope that nobody's going to get root access to your system, which uh, um, is pretty much impossible. Future work, uh, so things I really want to add to this. Uh, IP set is a big one. Uh, there's a couple of features that I really want to add uh, uh, inside IP set. Um, for example, when we have, we have a Nagios server that needs to have a list of all of the Nagios clients, which is pretty much every single server. That list becomes a huge, huge list of rules where you have one rule per IP. You end up having 400 rules uh, in a chain that are really just doing one thing. So instead of having those foreign rules, we could just have one IP set and one rule that points to the IP set. Um, another thing I'd like to do is to be able to block certain services to um, different uh, locations, geographic locations. And uh, I'd like to kind of pull the list of IPs from an area and, and load them into an IP set and just drop them. 
Um, so that's the kind of stuff I want to add. Um, recently, we rebuilt our Edge routers uh, on Linux, and uh, suddenly we had the need for forward rules. And that's something I need to add, because right now there's no way to declare forward rules. So you can use a predefined rule, uh, which is what we do for forward rules and that. So they're just copied verbatim. But if you want to do something dynamic, FW doesn't support it. IPv6 support. Uh, right now everything is IPv4, so I need to add support for IPv6. Eventually, EB tables and, uh, and some kind of wrapping the usage of modules like time or string, uh, kind of work in progress. And the bigger picture, and that's really what I'm aiming for, um, is uh, as a security engineer, I still manage security as a network level. And that's always going to be the case. But 60, 70% of what I do is answering the need of opening access from service one to service B. Now, service one and B are standard. They run the same type of servers. They want to talk on the same ports. They always do the same thing. So instead of manually creating rules or, or creating custom rules for those, I would just like to have a way to declare my service on one side. Uh, so I declare the accounting service, for example. And I say the accounting service depends on uh, the printing uh, service and depends on the human resources service. It also needs to talk to the graphite server and the internal SMTP. And it also needs to talk to those external APIs, surfos.com and paypal.com. And automatically in the back end, uh, Chef can process that and apply the standards that we the standards that we've set for the infrastructure to extract the firewall rules from that and push them to the system. The other major advantage of this is if your system goes down for any reason, you have automatically the list of services you need to restart before the accounting service. You know what you depend on. So it's a, it makes it a lot lot easier to manage uh, an infrastructure with a lot of different applications and to have the visibility over who's talking to who, because then there's no manually managed firewall rules. It's all defined in the policy. Um, that's kind of the goal. Um, before we get to the question, I have a little demonstration of how that works. Uh, that is um, a VM I'm running. So I have a, a VM environment uh, with a chef server running and a MongoDB VM running. So when you run chef client on the Mongo VM, for example, it will connect to the chef server, and that's what we see here. The chef server will tell the node, I don't know if that's readable from here. I can probably make it bigger a bit. Um, will return its run list. So this one has a run list, the base role, and the MongoDB replica set base role. And from that, then it will start executing the cookbook. So the, the logs of chef are very, very verbose. There's a lot of things. But um, here's what it usually does. Processing rule SNMP daemon out. Rule SNMP minimum out is searching for the role SNMP server in the chef environment vagrant. All right? But it didn't find one. So because it didn't find one, uh, it's going to use a stupid IP instead. Uh, the point of that, as opposed to just discarding the rule, uh, is because I want to know when I look at a node if why it doesn't have that rule. Is it because something didn't work somewhere, or because the rule was badly defined, or is it because the search didn't work? So it's easier to look at the rule set and see that um, and that, that black hole IP is an IP that doesn't exist in my production network because we don't use that range. Um, so uh, I have rules in there that are matching for nothing. And the point is to be able to see which one actually returned the results and which one didn't. And it does that. It loops over all of the, all of the rules and creates them automatically. Here, for example, we're looking for uh, the graphite server and it returns the IP 10.2.12.0.231, so it's adding into the rule set. And we can just look at the rule set in Etsy Firewall Rules, and that's what we have. Um, it's kind of unreadable. One thing I didn't talk about uh, is, and that's the manageability of it, um, instead of uh, having the rules um, organized by technical chains, I would like to say, with technical tables, like, hey, you're going out through that interface, or you're going out through that port, so I'm going to jump you to the good um, chain, then I organize it by user. And that's easier to manage because developers, when they run the system and they want to know why something isn't working for their MongoDB application, they just have to type this. And they type this and say, well, I'm running MongoDB, so I know if I'm going out, I'm going out through the MongoDB user. 
So if I'm not going out, I'm going to type that rule and I just get the rules that apply to the MongoDB user, as opposed to having the entire rule set and trying to figure out which one is going to apply to the MongoDB user. That works only for outbound rules, because on inbound, you cannot match against a user. Um, but a lot of time, the, and that's something I've noticed when developers or system mean look at rules, they look first at the album rules. That gives them a little bit of information. And how that, uh, an example of how those rules are defined. Uh, do I have that here? No. No. Nope. Nope. I must do the last one. There you go. Okay. So that's that's a role. Uh, that's the one we defined. That that's our default role for a MongoDB cluster replica set. And um, that every single member of uh, every single MongoDB cluster will use that role. We'll inherit from it. So we just have a small set of rules that are defined in here. Uh, and that say, for example, what we're looking at here is. Uh, this is an application entry point, so each MongoDB cluster will open its firewall for either a Node.js or a Python worker or a Python API um, application that shares the same tag here. So those rules are generic. All right. That was, uh, that was kind of fast. I think I have another 10 minutes, maybe 5 minutes for questions. So if you have any questions... Shoot. Great. One smart question. One not smart question. <laughs> All right. Well, excellent. No, <laughs> 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 well, thank you. Yep.